like to welcome the Director General, East Africa Regional Development and Business Delivery Office at the African Development Bank Group. Madam Nana Nabufo, welcome to Double O Direct. Thank you very much, Olivia. It's my great pleasure to be here it, with you this morning or midday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is my honor to have you. And I must say that you have not disappointed with the regalia. Uh, well, you look amazing. Well, thank you. I mean, like I always say, Nigerians are known to be very flamboyant with their dressing. And I don't want to disappoint <laughs> my people. <laughs> you have not. So before we get into the business of the African Development Bank, and especially the regional office that you are at the helm of. Tell me, who is Nana Nabufo? Yes, professionally, but also personally. Okay, thank you, Olivia. Um, who is Nana Nabufo? That's a big question for me. Um, of course, you can guess from what I said earlier, I'm Nigerian, um, living in Kenya, working for the African Development Bank. I'm married with two children, a boy called Michael and a daughter called Marvel. Uh, we named her Marvel because we searched and searched for her. And when she was born, um, it translates to the Bible. We marvel at the works of God because it took God. Now, um, I did my schooling in Nigeria. I graduated from the University of Lagos. I'm a great Akokite, um, Nigerians will say, I, with a first degree in BS, a BSc in economics. And after that, I went on to do my one-year compulsory youth service. I worked in a hospital as a public relations and admin officer. After that, I worked with a Danish overseas construction co company. Um, we were running as like a liaison officer in their liaison office in Lagos. And um, one year after that, um, they said they were closing their office. And thank God for, for God, because that same month, I was interviewed and I moved on to Chase, Man Manhattan, uh, Chase Merchant Bank at that time. Yes. So that's where my career in banking started. I spent about four years, four and a half there. I moved on to Capital Merchant Bank, where I spent another one and a half years before I joined the African Development Bank. I joined the bank at a very low level, working in treasury, foreign exchange trading, back office, um, uh, correspondent banking, I became a supervisor leading a team. We were doing cash planning, correspondent banking. And uh, after some years uh, working there, I moved to administration um, mm -hmm. to as a manager leading travel and logistics, um, policy issues like telephone policy, travel policy, and all those things. Um, and from there, I moved on to become the director of the budget department. Wow. And um, after, I think that was in January 2013, um, in 2015, yes. after two years of that, two and almost two and a half years, we had some crisis in the HR department, who was going to lead HR, the director had retired, the acting uh, had a heart attack and passed on and, you know, things were, so the uh, president at that time of the bank requested that I move to HR. Mm -hmm. and lead the HR department. And then um, from there, the vice president who was supervising HR, IT, and admin uh, decided she wasn't renewing her contract. I was asked also to step into that role and be supervising because it was an election year. A new president was coming. The yes. old president didn't want to bring in new people. So he wanted to give the new, whoever was going to be the new president, opportunity to uh, select their own leaders. So that's how I, I, I held the fourth until... Dr. Adeshina came, and in my engagement with him, one day he told me, he said, well, why are you here? You should be in the field. <laughs> so, um, and I think that conversation and yes. having engaged with him and he realized, okay, I came from a private sector banking background that I had more to give. Yes. But now what, in terms of it, um, what has kept me, I think, um, when I talk to young people and they talk about what keeps you focused on success, I tell them, you've, as a professional, you need to build a brand for yourself. True. For some people, their brand is fashion. They want to be the, the, you know, the attraction when they walk in. So mm -hmm. they just spend their time. For me as a professional, my brand had to be integrity. Yes. When my boss gives me something to do, can they go to bed mm -hmm. and know that I'll do it? Yes. And, you know, so will I deliver? Will I deliver on time? Will the quality be good? And, you know, it takes me to the passage, I think is in Galatians. I say, whatever is worthy. Yes. Whatever is honest, whatever mm -hmm. is worthy of reporting, you know, you that that's what we should 
focus on. Yes. So that has been my driving force. And of course, as a, somebody who is strong and passionate about showing off the qualities of Christ as a yes. Christian, yes. that is my focus. That is my testimony. Yes. So I want people to, when they remember me, not so much as I'm the director general of DADB, they remember me as somebody who is transparent, somebody who can engage, somebody who is humble, you know, to reach out to other people. So that's what has kept me going. And I think um, when you want to also be a professional, it's also good to uh, position yourself. When I got to the African Development Bank with a first degree and I realized I, I needed a master's to grow, I quickly enrolled into my master's degree program. Yes. So you also need to, you know, look at your, where do you want to go professionally, prepare yourself, but have the right character. Have the integrity that goes with it. If 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 the president is going to appoint me as the director general in East Africa, he doesn't want some to receive a bad report. Sure. So I must make sure that I am of good character. I can comport myself. You know, I'm trustworthy. You know, can people bring a good report about me about the bank? and what we are doing in East Africa. I love that even at your senior position, you still have the integrity for excellence. We are currently struggling with a lot of uh, mediocrity, especially amongst the youth. Uh, what advice can you give? Because it's really refreshing to hear somebody striving for excellence, somebody striving for that good report, and not just offering the bare minimum to sort of slide through in their day-to-day -day life and in their day-to-day -day professional obligations. So with the young people, especially and young women, what can you give them as an incentive to reach for higher to go for excellence? No, I think at the end of the day, we, uh, the women that are in leadership, have to show good example. I mean, I've had a lot of young people who um, reach out to me, you know, for me. I don't know them on mm -hmm. social media. They want me to mentor them. They want me to encourage me, and I'm very glad to do that. So we need to, the women leaders also need to set out time to mentor the younger ones and i think that's encouraging for the younger ones but i think it's because also societal values of the right behavior and the right character is uh, gradually dissipating so we also need to speak up in society and if if you're one of those that follow me you know that um on my on my twitter on um, linkedin those are the two main platforms where i'm very very active that you know we try to promote some of those cultural issues i'm, I'm i also preach in yes. the church so i promote some of the things we preach we try to talk to these people and there are some of them you know sometimes uh, the pastor tells me about this young girl who disappeared out of nowhere and the next thing they find she's pregnant oh. i don't know her but i reach out to her mm -hmm. try to find her something to do try to encourage her to stabilize her life so those of us who have sort of succeeded in quote we have to be role models not just by showing off ourselves but also by reaching out making out opportunities um, for us to uh, encourage the younger ones but i also think that there are quite also a few young people who are entrepreneurs in their own right yes and they are doing well so we need to set up maybe set up a mental system if it's through the church through the mosque through our local societies to find even in the office i make out time to engage with the women, with the young ones, to make sure that they are more, they are focused, they have ambition, and that ambition is driving them. And within the office, I do quite have a good team of women that I'm praying for that, you know, they're going to rise up and be like, uh, like some of us. Wonderful. Later. So just to conclude with the background, you've been in your current role as DGEA since uh, 2016? I arrived in Kenya in 2017 yes. as the um, Deputy Director General. Yes. And then I stepped into the acting role in, um, I think it was in September 2019. Yes. I was confirmed early last year. Yes. So, but generally as DDG, DG, you sort of do the same work. Yes. So I've been in this role since 2017 and it's a new role. Yeah. Um, like I said, the president said, told me you have to go to the field. I've always been a headquarters uh, person, yes. but I think I'm enjoying it. I've been blessed to work in almost every aspect of the bank. And you find that most times when we go to senior management meetings, they're talking about budget. I'm able to follow, you, for, uh, you know, mm -hmm. speak up. Mm -hmm. They're talking about um, HR. I've been there. They're talking about administration. If it's treasury work, you know, finance work, I've been there. Yes. So most times also it gives 
my colleagues as senior management, especially people who are just joining the bank, you know, they come forward to say, okay, let's hear what Nina has to say because I think she's, she's been, she understands most of these challenges from different angles. Excellent. Now, with regards to the tenure of uh, President Adesina, if you would compare the last two years since his re-election uh, as compared to the first two years, what would you say are s some of the impact that has been made with regards to his continued tenureship? You know, the, the, the thing about the, uh, pre uh, President Adesina is that he, from day one, came with a lot of passion. Yes. And the passion is still there. <laughs> so sometimes some of us wonder, wonder where does he get all this energy from? And uh, can he share some of it for us? So he's still the same. He's yes. not changed. Mm -hmm. He has a passion. He's somebody who is on an agenda to make sure that Africa develops. And I remember when he started newly, he used to say, Africa is tired of being in the dark, <laughs> you know, yes. and all that. And of course, being somebody who is an agric expert too, he's also extremely passionate about He's a former minister, right? For a minister for agriculture, yes. but that's also his area, mm -hmm. you know. So he's passionate about agriculture. He's passionate about Africa being able just not to produce in agri, but agro-industrial area. But and that passion has been consistent. Yes. So I I wouldn't say anything has changed, mm -hmm. but I think the closer he is getting to the second, uh, to the end of his second tenor, because he's a two tenor, he's not he's not going to be uh, uh, coming back. But the closer he gets, the more he's in a hurry to see what, how much he can step up the yes. achievement he's making for Africa. So I, uh, you know, and a lot of people that have had the opportunity to listen to him speak, yes, cannot help be amazed at you know, his passion and how he's able to communicate that passion. So whether it's in the climate change arena, whether it's in the agri, whether it's you're talking about youth, whether you're talking about women empowerment, even if you talk about infrastructure, everywhere you go, mm -hmm. he is there. He's yes. on top of it yes. and he's very passionate and engagement. He, he, you know, as the president of the African Development Bank is a platform mm -hmm. for us to be, for him to be the spokesperson for Africa. And he has that capacity and the ability to engage with leaders both in Africa and outside Africa. Yes. So that the voice of Africa can be heard. The challenges of Africa can be taken into consideration as we all work together, you know, to make sure that we can have an equal seat with other parts of the world at the table. Nena Nabufo, she is the Director General, East Africa, the African Development Bank. Questions including what the bank managed to do to help African economies during the COVID-19 pandemic and moving forward. I'm with the Director General, East Africa, Regional Development and Business Delivery at the Office of the African Development Bank Group, Nena Nwabufo. Thank you so much for highlighting the background and everything that led you to this moment and to this seat. But of the $10 billion, now we're talking about COVID, that the bank set aside to assist African economies just wade through this pandemic just to survive what can you tell me of how those funds were used or distributed especially in east africa okay um well we during the you know COVID took everybody by surprise by end of 2019 um we thought okay this is something happening in china and the 2020 started and we went about our business i remember i was actually I had been traveling, I was in Cote d'Ivoire twice, I'd been to uh, Djibouti and back, and um, I was in Comoros, um, and um, we, when I got to Comoros and even people were trying to shake my hand, this was in March, I didn't want to, they were angry. Exactly. Yeah. So I said, well, I've just come off a plane, you better, I think it's better you don't shake me. Um, so we left Comoros, it must have been on the 14th of March, if I remember very well, it was a Sunday and we arrived back and I was supposed to get on the flight two days later and head to Djibouti and the team had gone ahead of me and they sent a message that the Djiboutians said they should leave, their, leave and start going back to where they came from. Oh. Um, so luckily uh, they went on KQ, uh, KQ had stopped flying, we were able to get them out. Um, with Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. So um, within and by the within that week, 
um, Kenya closed its airspace, mm -hmm. office, uh, office decided everybody worked from home. So it took everybody by surprise. Yeah. And by that time, of course, uh, we've planned our budget, we've planned our programs for the year. So we quickly had to go back to the drawing board and say, what can we do? Yes. What is possible? Mm -hmm. Now, the way we, you see, we are not... Um, the African Development Bank is a development bank owned by 84 countries. Most of our fund is either money that is given by our shareholders or money we borrow from uh, the capital market. So it's not like it's not like a country. I mean, the European Union can decide we are giving 100 billion million yes. from and then everybody contributes. So our programs are planned. We plan it based on how much can we lend to these countries, how much the grants that the with money we've received from our uh, uh, from our donors yes how much of it are we going to be supposed to be using this year so what we had to do was look at all that and see what is the maximum facility we can give mm -hmm. so so it's not a set aside mm -hmm. it's a program we designed to say okay based on the resources we see in yes. our portfolio we can do up to 10 Billion. Billion dollars. Now, the particular thing, the reason why we needed to make that is th that statement or to repurpose and repackage it specifically is that you find that um, we most of the countries what they needed was a budget support, and yes. budget support is not something we do so care you know easily. It's planned, and we have our target, yes. so we needed to increase that target mm -hmm. in order to support as many countries as possible and then we took it down to each country how much business can we do in this country this year but out of the amount we can use for budget support how much can we do for each country yes and budget support is usually tied to an imf program so there are some countries also that didn't have imf program yes what can we do for them so essentially it was like an emergency support mm. countries have shut their borders a country like kenya depends on tourism they depend on a huge income from the mombasa port yes shops were closed mm -hmm. so those shops can generate income to pay tax so and at the same time governments needed to put in place a system with facilities medical facilities that were, were supposed to cost the money that they didn't plan for yes. they so the budget that governments made that year was thrown into mm -hmm. the sea <laughs> and at the same time people were asking for the government to support companies that had close support individuals have lost their job support already the government like for example in kenya was already supporting some people mm -hmm. so you needed to expand that where was the money going to come from sure. so what we needed I was from at the bank and other development partners, World Bank, even count bilateral donors was to support the provide money to support the budget of mm -hmm. the government. So that's why we call it budget support okay. operation. Now, you don't when you're also providing money to support the budget, you don't just give money and say, okay, here, put in your budget. We specify, okay, okay we want this money to go into providing, you know, personal P PPE equipment, providing uh, ICU centers. We want part of it to be social safety nets uh, for the vulnerable. We also want part of it to cover up for the taxes that you're no longer going to get. To so we had to define key things that the funds were going to do. So, and that was, it was in this, that sense. And normally when we do that, we also work with the World Bank, with other bilateral donors to be sure that we are all working with them the same space and we are all synchronizing our activities. Now, for some of the countries where we couldn't do budget support, yes. we used like WHO to come in mm -hmm. and support them in building medical structures mm -hmm. that could help them manage the COVID situation. We're also working with WHO, also working with the East African community. We also provided some funding so that they can put up some, um, some centers yes. at the borders you know, even for the few people. And some of the budget support that we give to some of the countries, we also uh, gave it to them on a regional basis to say, since there's a lot of movement between your countries, make sure that you have clinics, test centers, exactly. you know, at the borders where people cross. So it's 
it encompassed a lot of things and it's one area where overnight the international community came together. I'm not sure if we didn't have that kind of collaboration, what would have happened to us in Africa because we were very unprepared. We didn't have the medical systems. But most importantly, God was kind to Africa. Indeed. Because the kind of if we saw the kind of impact that other parts of the world saw, I don't think you and I would be here speaking today. We definitely would not yeah. have been. And this is where I must agree with you wholeheartedly that God was kind to Africa, especially when it comes to COVID-19 and us surviving it. Mm. Mm. Madame Nana, since its inception in 2016, the 10-year the Jobs for Youth program has had quite an Im impressive impact. But I would like to know more specifically for East Africa and for Kenya, what can you say about that program with regards to the jobs provided, blue collar, white collar, um, and where it is going with regards to its ending in around 2025? Um, you, you have to, we have to realize that the youth, the program may end, but the pro youth program may not we, is still there. And when such programs end, what we try to do is to review. So I'm sure there is going to be like an independent assessment: what was set out to be achieved, and what are we, what has been achieved, where are the gaps, yes. why, and what can we do. So I'm sure you are going to see a succession strategy it may not be called jobs for youth i'm not sure what they will call it yes but definitely um we realize that the youth uh job situation needs to be looked into uh, what we try to do apart from we we've worked with setting up uh, incubation centers uh, fintech is one area where the youth have been very very um active and we are glad that in africa we are attracting a lot of uh, investments in the fintech area and we've seen some young people People doing amazing things sure. in that area but one thing we do when we design any project every and any project what we try to do is also to ask ourselves what is the need for the youth yes. what is the need for the women so so when you see a project team yes. it comprises of experts from various areas so every project the bank designs must have a target for youth you yes. must have a target for women. And so part of what, if we are constructing a road, for example, um, we ask, what do the youth along that road corridor, what do they do? Can we have some capacity building work, you know, that will support them? Yes. And we try to handle that. What did the women do? Can we have something? Okay, there are women that we are building a road and women sell on that road. What happens to the women on that road? Mm -hmm. Where can we put better market facilities for them. So that's the kind of question we ask. Now, we also had this um, program we call the Enable Youth Program. Mm -hmm. And with the Enable Youth Program also, we are linking it more or less to agri. You realize that in Africa, most of our population are in the agri sector. Yes. So we link it to the agri sector. And what we try to do is to um, support agripreneurs yes. and then ask them to mentor other agripreneurs and also we work with universities in their agri sector so that they can increase the capacity of the youth in the agri sector so these are some of the things we are doing another thing we have also been doing in kenya in particular is that we've been very active in the tvet sector mm, that's important. okay we've actually uh, supported the construction of about nine TFET facilities. We've also supported the renovation of about 24 TVET centers, building of dormitories, and even in some of these handicaps, like the blind school in Karen, yes. building um, dormitory facilities so that they can take more youth and train them. We, because if you're going to um, uh, um, do agro-industrial processing, industrialization, and all those things. You yes. need human capital. True. So we have worked a lot in the uh, TVET sector to make sure. And then also one area we do is to even train the trainers, the teachers in the TVET sector. Over 200 of them have been trained to our, through our programs. Yes. So provide the youth the opportunity for them to get some kind of technical and vocational training and to position them to go out there and be the, you know, the breadwinners and the leaders of tomorrow. I like what you're saying. And one thing that's key for the youth, um, of course, is employment. And a lot of youth are being employed in private sector and have seen that uh, the African Development Bank is very passionate about growing uh, private sector operations in the countries in which it operates. I would like to understand, uh, most recently there was um, 
a promise by the Japanese at TCAD, you know, to support private sector development. But historically, if you can just outline some of the works uh, the bank has been involved in with regards to private sector engagement and growth. Okay, now I, I think, um, yes, we, the Japanese in general, they, they talked about uh, 31 billion yes. to Africa, but specifically 5 billion to DADB. And this 5 billion, it's not new because mm -hmm. we already have a Japanese private sector uh, engagement yes. special fund that we have been using uh, to support the private sector. We've been using to build capacities of the private sector um, in specific some of them if, if you go to a place like Seychelles uh, um, we are using it to build the, the capacity of the SMEs in the blue economy sector um, when the, the discovery of oil between Tanzania and Uganda we also got some money from the Japanese um, a special fund to build the capacity of the SMEs along that corridor to take opportunity so it's something that is it's a relationship that has been ongoing for some time and we're very glad that the Japanese continue to support the bank and we're looking forward to how we can use this five billion to do much more in the private sector. Now, one of the main areas in which we are helping the private sector because, you know, we are not like a commercial bank. Yes. We are a development bank and I initially, we actually started only lending to governments. Mm -hmm. So the, our private sector business grew over time. Um, and so one, one of the key areas through which we work with private sector is through commercial banks. If you look around, we have a lot of lines of credit with commercial banks and Kenya is one of the leading uh, area, countries where we have this line of credits. Uh, and what we try to do with this line of credits is to provide funding to these commercial banks. You know, the cost of us preparing a private sector operation yes. is very high. And therefore, when we are preparing a private sector operation that is less than 10 million, the, it's almost it, it, it's rare for us to accept because the cost is extremely high for yes. us. Yes. But a lot of, uh, when you take 10 million, for example, in Kenya, yes. you are looking at maybe 1.2 billion mm -hmm. on that. So how many companies are at that level? So those, in order to make sure that the SMEs mm -hmm. are taken care of. So we decide to go through the commercial banks that are able and more suited to do with this SME. So yes. we give them lines of credit. Yes. And we also set um, targets for them mm -hmm. on how many, how much of that money sh they should focus on using to support the SMEs. Okay. So the one problem I do see, however, yes. is that a lot of the SMEs are not integrated into the commercial banking system. True. So I do get a lot of emails. Somebody says, oh, I'm a farmer. I have organized farming. I have one acre. Give me um, 10 million shillings. Yes. You know, to, <laughs> so they are looking for ways to circumvent that. Yes. And I keep telling them, you have to go to your commercial bank. Yes. Because, and this is a message for the SMEs that are listening. Mm -hmm. When you are not into commercial banking, when you need to go to grow your business, you have no history, mm -hmm. financial history. So you can't. And organizations like ours can't help you. Mm -hmm. Because we do not do small volume banking. Yes. So. And that's why we give the lines of credit yes. uh, to these commercial banks so that they can then, um, they take in bulk yes. and then they begin to distribute to the SMEs. So SMEs need to find the, their way to commercial banks. They also need to find a way to formalizing and, you know, making themselves formal. Yes. A lot of, some of them may do it because they don't want to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And, but at the end of the day, you want the government to provide roads. You want the government to give you water, electricity. True. But so everybody's got to contribute to this economic and social development of our countries. I completely agree. But uh, are there any oversight structures with regards to these financial institutions that the African Development Bank works with, with regards to ensuring, for example, that the money that you've set aside, you know, for those SMEs, for those uh, women entrepreneurs for youth projects are actually funneled into those programs. Is there any feedback loop, for example? Well, I wouldn't say over, <coughs> excuse me, over stru oversight structures. Yes. One, our projects are supposed to be um, supervised twice a year. Mm -hmm. So our t experts do visit these organizations, yes. try to look at, and then sometimes we can do spontaneous visits to some of the com companies that they say they are supporting. But we're also looking at how to automate mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. these things so that everything is in a portal where we can see okay these are the companies getting but definitely sometimes when we sometimes we have like seminars um, and some of these people come some of the uh, the entrepreneurs mm-hmm. uh, come and show off what they are manufacturing yes. with the support that they have received from so some of those commercial banks sometimes um, come like I was in Tanzania the other time so they bring some of the beneficiaries to come and show of what they are doing and of course we have a we have a responsibility to talk about these achievements yes. so sometimes also we send out people to go and write stories about talk to you see when if I if, if I say I we have built something in Kenya yes. when our communication team come they don't talk to me oh and they don't talk to the people that got the, the you know the intermediaries. They want to talk to the beneficiaries. Fantastic. Because that's the only way you can assess. And of course, we also have our, our auditors do come. Yes. And when they come, you say you've built a school. You say you they go there, independent, and you don't go with them. Yes. Yes. So they go there to verify. Then we also have what we call the independent uh, development evaluation t- team. Yes. They report directly to the board. Okay. So. Like these jobs for youth we talked about earlier on, they are going to do an evaluation on it. Like in Kenya, we have this project, Last My Connectivity. Yes. That they, they have come, they've evaluated it. And the point is not just about talking about what has been achieved, but we also look at what are the lessons we can learn. Mm-hmm. The lessons can be from the mistakes, from the challenges, mm-hmm. from other, but it can also be about the successes. Yes. What made this a success? And how can we replicate that in other areas to make sure that we can achieve the same success? So there are so many areas we are watching. We do realize that if you're not vigilant, you may not realize the, yes. the objectives. So we are very vigilant about that. And uh, the, the commercial banks also know they also have a reputation to protect. Yes. And it's not just any commercial bank. There are fiduciary con- you know, assessments that have to go into it. And a lot of times you find that s- we, commercial banks that have had core results on what they are doing with SMEs, we yes. find it easier to work with them because they already have a track record that uh- they can build on. I love it. And we're going to be talking about funding, (coughs) funding for women. There's a special program run by the African Development Bank, especially for that. AFAWA, just for those who don't uh, know, the acronym means Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa. Now, when um, we've always had targets for women, we've always talked about gender. And I remember during the time of Dr. Kaberuka, he appointed... uh, a sister um, Geraldine uh, Fraser Mulekati from South Africa as the special envoy on gender. But when uh, Dr. Adeshina came on board, yes. he also felt that we are not doing enough. Um, so before I talk about Afawa, I just want to say, yes, I'm Director General for East Africa. And in the bank, we have five regions um, plus Nigeria, six, so three of the Director Generals are women. Wow. Yes. We have West Africa. Yes. We have Southern Africa that are women. So that's part of the things that he decided that we need to also. Uh, and the three of us are people who have been in the bank system for a while. So yes. not our people who came from outside. Um, so women is very women are very important. Um, women uh, in West. I don't know about here, but in West Africa, women drive the economy. You get on a flight from. Um, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, remember when I started working in Abidjan, newly from um, um, Abidjan to Lagos, the flight is full of women traders yes, who yes. are trading. Um, so they run that informal sector. Mm-hmm. And in West Africa, most of the traders are women. The men also trade as well. But you find that um, most of the women become uh, traders by virtue of that they are home, they're looking for something to do to support their families and then they start trading and before you know it they get big. Mm-hmm. So what Afawa sets out to do is to we ask ourselves how can we support women? And you see that Afawa principal one of the principal avenues is through a guarantee fund. We're working with the African Guarantee Fund. Mm-hmm. And why is it a guarantee fund? Because women do not culturally and traditionally have the collateral to go to the bank to borrow. So the land, most of the land belong to the men. Yes. So most of the assets that women, a woman may have jewelry. Mm-hmm. So we also, part of what we are asking government, because Afawa also helps with 
governments with policy, mm -hmm. can we collateralize, collateralize the jewelry of women and they can use it yes. as you know, collateral? Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things. What is it that the women have at home that they can collateralize to? to? But most importantly, the guarantee you see, when uh, you go to a commercial bank to borrow money, they want to be sure that they are going to be repaid. True. So what does a guarantee do? A guarantee tells them, okay, if you lend this person 100, uh, uh, 10,000 shillings, yes. um, I'm, I'll, I'm going to guarantee at least 2,500 of those or 5,000 of those shillings. I will make sure if they don't pay you, I will pay. Mm -hmm. So it's a partnership we are building with the African Guarantee Fund, with these commercial banks, to make sure that they can have the comfort to give extend credit to women SMEs so that these women, their businesses can grow. Yes. The other thing we do in our FAWA is capacity building. So we organize capacity building opportunities. Um, the one we had uh, in... Um, in Tanzania, yes. what we were also trying to do in Tanzania was to talk, have, we brought experts to talk to the financial institutions about the particularities of dealing with women, mm -hmm. give them the capacity. And one of the things we try to do with the banks where that we work with, uh, when we give them a line of credit, we also support it with some kind of technical assistance. And that technical assistance is to help them customize their systems to specifically manage this special group of people. Yes. Because most times their systems are not customized to deal with. It's a one, uh, one, uh, one size fits all. Yes. We yes. want a special customized system for women. We provide them with capacity building. What are the characteristics of women that make them different mm -hmm. in the way they conduct business from the men? We also want to make sure that they, their systems are customized to sort of track, you know, what they are doing in the women's space. Yes. And of course, we always start small. And as we see them grow and develop, we do much more. So yes, yes of course, I was in Tanzania and we did sign some agreements with one of the commercial banks there. Yes. And we had quite a lot of women. They came to display their products. And we had a lot of um, participants from the various commercial bank areas. And of course, the minister in charge of the women affairs wasn't there, but the permanent secretary and other directors from the various um, um, areas came and participated in this conversation that we had about how we can support women. Um, of course, we started, Tanzania was the first place we started um, because they also have a woman president, president yes. so it was important. <laughs> but most importantly, we've also had some successes with the commercial bank that we, CRB did, that we've been working with in, in Tanzania, and we felt it would be good to launch this. But it's just the beginning. We definitely will be getting to other East African countries. And what I tell the team in Afawa is that I am, we shouldn't stop at Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, the big ones. In East Africa, our East Africa region covers 13 countries, yes. diverse. A country as small as Seychelles with 100,000 people, a country as big as Ethiopia with over 100 million people. They are dif the challenges are different, but we must find a way to reach every, op take every opportunity to support the women in, the, in all this that in countries. So looking at Afawa and looking at um, the launch that was held in Tanzania and now looking to extending the program in other East African countries, what can you tell these women entrepreneurs that would be almost like a foundation for them to then reach out to these financial institutions? Firstly, how do they identify the financial institutions that have this sort of relationship with the African Development Bank, number one? And then number two, uh, from your relationships and conversations with the commercial institutions that is going to be working with the bank, what will they need to provide in order to, let's say, have access to these funds? Okay, you know, I, when I spoke earlier on, I talked about SMEs yes. uh, not getting into the financial sector. Yes. The fact is that even though we have a FAWA, even though we have a guarantee, the commercial banks are still obliged to do the due diligence to be sure that you can pay. Yes. So, because, and you know, during, uh, incidentally in Tanzania, one of the women said, but can the commercial banks tell us which one is the Afawa loan. They will not. <laughs> because the moment you know somebody is guaranteeing you, yes. you decide, okay. But 
I'm safe. Apart from that also, we are not guaranteeing 100%. Because mm -hmm. if we are guaranteeing 100%, the commercial bank also may become delinquent as yes. well. So we are all working together as a partnership. Mm -hmm. They still have a responsibility to do the due diligence. They still have a responsibility to make sure that this business you are doing viable. is commercially viable mm -hmm. and is... Um, it will not disappear. Sustainable. How, well. Yeah, mm -hmm. sustainable. How? One of the ways they we are going to do that is one. Mm. If you don't have a relation, if they look around the banking system, they can't find you. You don't <laughs> exist. Yes. You can disappear with the money they are giving you. Mm. The second thing is you must keep a good account. If you don't have an accounting system to show what you've been doing, what are your assets, what do you produce, yes. how much did you produce, it cost you to produce last year and how much did you say what are your profits who are you um who are your emplo employees yes, yes. so you must have an account account and keeping your books yes. these are some of the things you need to show yes. showing cash flow yes. you say oh i was able to make five million shillings last year where is your bank statement that shows in and out, out of that so a lot of smes decide that they won't get into the formal sector they will rather maybe borrow 10,000 from some of these um, telephone based but yes. you can't grow a business like, like that, that. Mm -hmm. and what we are looking to achieve in the African Development Bank is that businesses grow and they employ people they create opportunities to employ people they expand yes. that's how social and economic development comes about so get into banking even if it's 1000 i remember when i first opened an account in london i had only 10 pounds yes. that's what i put in it yes many years ago so yes. you start small and as the bank sees that money is coming and going coming and going they say this person is doing business and a lot of times some of those banks are even the one when i worked in commercial i worked in the merchant bank yes so you reach out to the people that you know that you are sure that they are doing business and they may have money and then they may need your business services yes. Yes. so get into the formal sector get into the banking sector oh they are going to charge me some money but it is going to but be worth it what as you grow as and then you get grow. access to funds like the one in the afawa fund by the african exactly and of course how do you know whether your bank is doing afawa or not well, if you don't have any bank at all <laughs> We are not going to be advertising for you. Go to this bank. They yes. have our power. Yes. No, if you're yes. not already in the banking system, you have a problem. You have no business looking up to our power. That is so true. This is a safe space for women. So as you say, I'm looking for women segment co-hosts. But I'm number four. You have no idea how many men want to be segment co-hosts on my <laughs> show. <laughs> But yes, I'm continuing my conversation with the Director General East Africa mm. at AFDB, Nena Nwabufo. Um, we're talking about food security and 14.4 million are facing hunger right now. They're malnourished with another just over 4 million facing starvation in Kenya. What is the bank doing with regards to trying to ensure food security for the region? Okay, uh, thank you, Olivia. I think um, if you've been listening to the news, you'll see that just like you talked about the COVID yes. um, facility, we also, um, our board approved a 1.5 billion Africa emergency food production facility as well. Yes. Uh, we've already um, approved programs for Kenya. We've approved for Somalia. I think Somalia. We've approved for Burundi. We are working on uh, something uh, for Comoros, for Sudan, uh, South, so many other countries. But most importantly, also, we are working on a special one for the Horn of Africa okay. as well. But before then, last year, I think it was in December last year, we approved another f uh, program for building um, food and nutrition security yes. uh, in, in the Horn of Africa as well. In fact, the program we approved recently for Somalia, we, we added it to that one. But for Kenya, we had this separate. And yes. what we are trying to do with uh, this program yes. is to see how we can support the countries to bring in seed, to bring in fertilizer, yes. not necessarily to start importing wheat, okay. Okay. Uh, but to bring in the seed, to bring in the fertilizer so that the farmers can have all what they need for the farming season so that by the next um, harvesting season that mm. the, the farming does not continue. But having said that, I think 
One of the ambassadors from the embassy is a lady ambassador who was sitting with me when we went for the development partner groups meeting, This re, re, raised this issue with me. Mm -hmm. And I think I was also speaking with uh, the board members of a venture capital fund that uh, specializes in agri. Yes. And they were asking me about challenges yes. and about the Russia-Ukraine crisis, the yes. conflict. Yes. And I told them, I don't see, for me, I'm not seeing it as a challenge, I'm seeing it as an opportunity. For us that to step up. Af Africa needs to get its act together. Our governments, a family cannot, that cannot feed it. A father that, or a mother, parents that cannot feed their children is a problem. Mm -hmm. And our fathers, our parents, our mothers, they failed Africa. Yes. We have the capacity. God gave us the land. Yes. God gave us the weather. I have been to many countries in East Africa. Yes. Yes. Beautiful mm -hmm. weather soil yes to feed ourselves and to feed the rest of the world we have the majority of the land for production of food in the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we are not using it exactly. we africa spends 30 billion that it does not have to import food that it should be producing itself to yes. feed its citizens and also to feed the rest of the world yes so what we become net we import us of food when we should be net ex we should be exporting mm -hmm. so there is um, you have, they say you have to put your money where your mouth is. We're not doing that. We are shipping out opportunities for jobs, for economic development, for social development out of Africa into other places. We need to redirect. And most of our, most of our population are in agriculture, especially yes. the rural population. Yes. So what does that mean? It means that they are not getting enough of what they need in terms of equipment. Mm -hmm. They are not getting in terms of fertilizer. They are not getting enough in terms of finance mm -hmm. in order to step up the game. Yes. So governments need to go back to the drawing board and come up with policies. You know, I, I was um, uh, telling somebody that this drought thing yeah. is since I've been in, of course, when you're in West Africa, you don't really see it that yes, much. Yes. I've been in East Africa for five years and every year is drought. Yes. And I think, uh, for example, in Kenya, mm -hmm. the next government, I'm going to try to encourage them to see how they can use whatever allocation that comes from the bank to focus. How do we, what do we do to solve this drought program? Yes. Because every year people bring in hundreds of millions to support and the money is like the wind blows. You don't see. But that is next why year we continue. come back. Yes. We need hardcore infrastructure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is going to stop this drought situation. We also even do you know that there are heat resistant seeds that wow. you can use. Okay. To grow even where there is a lot of heat and drought. We that's part of what the African Development Bank is doing. Yes. We have tried that in Sudan, in um in Ethiopia, Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. and they've been able to increase their wheat yield so many times over. So you're telling me that so even in the north of Kenya, we have an opportunity for agriculture. Be, we have to find that opportunity. Mm -hmm. you, we have to. Yes. We're not the only uh, continent that has areas that are prone to drought. They have it in the U.S. They have it even in, in Israel, the Middle East, in Israel. In yes. Israel. And yet they are exporting the food, flowers, fruits, yes. everything, yes. vegetables to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a colleague who went home on holiday and came back and she comes from one of those desert areas and she said, what can't Chinese do? Yes. She, that she, they always, we always told her, oh, because your land is mostly desert, you can't grow anything. She went on holiday, she saw the Chinese living in the desert and growing their food there. Wow. We've got to find that technology. And that's why in the, in, in the bank, we also have a program we call TAT. Technologies for African um, Agricultural Transformation. Yes. So governments need to stop leaving the crumbs mm -hmm. for the agri sector of their financing. Yes. Agri needs to come back on board as the center so that we feed our people, we export food, we save money from imports, and then we make money from what we export. Exactly. And also we create economic and social opportunities for the 60 or 70 percent of people who are in agri and most of them in the rural areas so their children are not tempted to start trooping to the cities to look for what to do and there is no job yes for them yes so food security is an issue and we need to bring it on the table governments need to do more and east it. africa has very good arable land we have very good soil yes yeah, we do very good madame now before before i let you go any parting words for double o direct listeners 
Well, um, you know, I, like I was saying, I was talking to an ambassador the other day. Oh, wait, I must pause you for one second because I met with Irene Giribaldi from uh, the uh, European, European Union, Union. And she told me, oh, you have an interview with Nena. She is a fantastic fantastic she said manager so clearly your management skills have been impressive the world over thank you thank <laughs> you thank you irene i hope you're listening um i was talking to this ambassador and i told her and i said to her we have africans dying on the sea to go to europe mm. everybody wants to go to australia to canada to america and until our governments and our citizens begin to understand that those places we are running to they didn't start off that way. There was once they were like Africa. Mm -hmm. So we need to build, begin to build those systems. And we were talking about it more in terms of everybody wants the government to give subsidy for fuel, yes. give subsidy for food, mm -hmm. give subsidy for everything. Mm -hmm. Housing, education. Money does not grow on trees. So yes. those societies that Africans are running to, there are no subsidies for fuel. Mm -hmm. There are no subsidies for food. Mm -hmm. There are no subsidies for everything. Everybody works and everybody pays their taxes. And then the government uses the money to develop. And then we want to leave our own countries and go there. But every African isn't going to go there. So mm -hmm. we all have a hand on deck. I am somebody who is, I'm not for subsidies. Mm -hmm. When you subsidize fuel, mm -hmm. even the people that have 10 cars, do get benefit, benefit. from that and yes. the people who ride mat matatu benefit so how do the people when you go to canada you have the bus system yes. and if you're a student when you're buying your card mm -hmm. you buy you get your subsidy from there yeah if you are over 65, 65 you get your subsidy from there yeah. so the subsidy goes to the people and the rich people don't need they don't use bus yeah. but if they decide to use bus they still get the subsidy mm -hmm. so we have to find so we have to you see all this matatu creating havoc we have to find a way to turn them into very well run automated businesses yes, yes. and then we you can channel your subsidies so that the people who really need it get it and those who need to pay taxes and who don't need subsidy don't benefit from it unnecessarily there is a and every african should proudly pay their tax and every government should show the citizens what they're doing with the tax yes so that people can be encouraged. You cannot escape paying your tax in the U.S. or in Canada. You cannot. That's why the economy is... So if you don't do your part as a citizen, you have no right to complain that government is not doing their part. But if you do yours as a citizen, you have a right to hold the government accountable. I understand that the African Development Bank is very strong on good governance and leadership. Um, I would like to understand, are there any sort of caveats or structures that the bank imposes on governments when working with them on developmental projects? Well, I don't know whether it's the, the, to start with um, all our projects before we even uh, do that. We have to evaluate your financial management system yes. that you have the correct teams in place. Yes. Um, so for some of the countries that are struggling, we usually will go through an implementing partner. Maybe one of the UN agencies will be the one then working on the project just mm -hmm. to make sure that um, you that you know the money does not disappear but mm -hmm. of course we also have a very strong procurement procedures that you have to use and by the way like if we are building a road yes. we don't give the gov money the government to the government to build the road okay. the contractor is selected we review the process of selection and then when they as they build we pay directly to the contractor oh, and wow. of course we do have a mechanism where citizens or other contractors can complain about a procurement process you must have seen so many times when uh, we have sanctioned uh, and suspended operations with some companies. So we want to make sure that, of course, you cannot be 100% sure, yes. but every dollar is very well used. But we also work in the policy area. So we also help governments with setting up debt management systems mm -hmm. to be more transparent in their debt management analysis. Mm -hmm. We also, you find that the World Bank may come in and do an expenditure review. We work with them on that to see, to make sure that the expenditure. So we also, um, as a development partner group in total, when, for example, when the KEMSA, uh, was it uh, 
what's the name of the organization that was doing the medical supply KEMSA yes. uh, scandal came, yes. the government, the ministers in charge and the coordinating minister yes. so many times had to come to the development partners group to tell us what the government is doing yes. to stop that and has anybody been punished? What have you done to make sure it doesn't happen? Again. So mm -hmm. we work at the bank level but we also work with other development partners to hold the government accountable yes. and sometimes you find that there are certain types of projects we don't do because they are susceptible to putting a lot of money into the hands of people where the money may disappear. disappear. So our programs are adapted country by country depending on their financial management systems and our own comfort that this money, uh, we the worst thing mm -hmm. that can happen to us is to get into a project that has corruption scandals. Yes. And of course we have zero tolerance, extremely zero tolerance for our staff getting involved in corruption. As I am now, mm -hmm. um, if I go to the, the people that we do projects with, they are not allowed to give me a pen. Wow, and there I was with a huge basket of gifts. No, I'm just joking. No, I, I wasn't no, giving you anything. Uh, yeah. the, well, I don't work with, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I work with you, but <laughs> if I go, like, for example, if I go on a project mm. uh, visit and yes. then they give me a cow, oh, no way. No. Or they decide to give me big press. I can't take it. And whatever I take, sometimes it's embarrassing not to, exactly. to say no, but you have to turn it in. Mm. You have to report it and turn it in yes. when you arrive. So I also like the fact that the bank has transparency with its projects where you can mm. go online or you can approach the bank and ask to see uh, exactly how a certain project was um, greenlit, uh, its, its development stage. And I think that is fantastic. And even their right to appeal if something has been made confidential for certain reasons. Um, that really gives a lot of confidence in the work of the African Development Bank. Of course, all our all our documents, project documents are out there for everybody to see. And of course, this year, the African Development Bank was uh, rated as the most transparent organization out of all the MDBs. Wow. So we were number, the rated number one yes. because we have, a, an, uh, we have a, a policy on access and disclosure of information to make sure that people can actually see what we are doing and interrogate it. You have a right to question. Nana Nabufo, thank you for taking time out of your busy Saturday when the, you get to, to, to put your feet up and rest to come here to Spice FM and to be my guest on Double O Direct. Thank you very much, Olivia. Spice